We're going to start the artist talk portion of the evening. Um, so I'll just introduce Clint and then we can, we can tell you more in his, in his own words about this project. Um, so Clint it was born and raised in a small town in Saskatchewan. And he, just, he has an affinity for that province. Um, prior to pursuing a career in art, he spent three years with the Canadian military um, and uh, also uh, briefly pursued a career as a firefighter. And he began his BFA at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg and finished at the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon. And in 2006, he completed his MFA at Concordia University. And recent exhibitions include um, the massive O Canada show at the Massachusetts Museum of Contemporary Art um, in North Adams, Massachusetts, and um, Gasoline Alley and Other Sunday Dreams, which just wrapped up at the Mendel Art Gallery in Saskatoon. And he now lives and works on acreage near the town of Osler, Saskatchewan. And um, just to put into context, you know, the the show here, we have a show coming up uh, in October that's focusing on um, ceramic work from the 70s and so I thought it would be really important to show what, uh, what other possibilities are for ceramic work and contemporary practices. So um, it's really exciting to have Clint uh, available to come and show us his work and also this newer volume of work, The Light Boxes, so I will turn over to you to say more. Thank you. Um, first, I just want to say a big thanks to Nicole. She's been really great to work with, and um, I think you guys have a really uh, great facility here. And it's really nice to come down here. This is my first time, time here, so uh, yeah, it's been really great. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm never like, quite exactly just what, not sure what to say about my work. Um, this stuff, this, the, the sort of ceramic work all started after I left Concordia. Um, I always think that uh, like one of the best decisions I made as an artist was to go to grad school and, and then this, the second best decision I made was to forget everything I learned in grad school. Um, uh, and so, uh, because when I was in school, it's, it's always very like theoretical and academic and um, it's, you know, you always have to like talk about everything. And, and, uh, and so when I finished grad school, I, I was kind of at, at a bit of a loss because I didn't really know what direction I wanted to go with my work. And um, and so I just thought like whatever I'm just gonna like make stuff I'm just gonna start making stuff um, and uh, and I just sort of thought like what do I want to do I don't even know what I want to do and uh, so it really just started with this idea of making that like a really shiny beautiful engine and I wasn't exactly sure why but I just thought that's what I was gonna do um, and uh, so I started talking with a friend of mine uh, his name is Ray Logan and he's a uh, Car guy. I'm not a car guy, despite what, what uh, you know, my practice sort of entails. And so I, I told him my idea, and he said, "Well, I know, I know what engine you want." And I said, "Oh, great!" So, so we went to an auto records, and, and uh, you know, we were scouring around, and we found one. I said, "This is the one you want." I said, "Okay." So we pulled this engine out of the car, and, and I started doing some research on it, and um, found that it, the first engine that I found was a, a 1951 uh, Ford Flathead, which has this really rich sort of automotive history to it, which I really liked. Um, and when I started with these, I knew I knew right from the beginning that what I wanted was an old engine. I wanted something that was mechanical, not computer controlled. Because for me, these were these were objects that um, have a history that really sort of circul circulates around sort of certain perceptions of masculine ideas of what men are. What I really was drawn to these sort of older mechanical things. Um, and, uh, and I just started making them. And uh, sort of, I think that uh, through the process of not thinking about it too much, you know, sort of a broader context for these works developed. And, uh, you know, just more became more became more. Uh, I always remember an interview of an author that I heard on CBC, and I don't know who the author was. Um, but he said something. That, that really resonated with me and the interviewer asked him, you know, where does your inspiration for your stories come from? And he said, I, I don't know where it comes from, but I know where it goes. It goes to my desk and if I'm not there, it doesn't wait for me. And so that's been a real model for, for me and my production. Um, I, I go to my studio and I work and, I, and it's, it's like I punch a car. I go to the studio at 8. Actually, I just walk down the stairs because I live in my studio. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I, you know, I go there at eight and I work till five or seven or ten, or whatever. But for me, it's.
it's it's an everyday job, and I don't always know what I'm doing every day. Um, but if I don't go and do that, then nothing will happen. And in a lot of ways, that's where these light boxes uh, started coming from, um, like the engine. But I just sort of had this idea of what I wanted. Um, the idea of the chandelier was always something that stuck in my head. I really, like, I really, I kind of, there's a thing that I'm drawn to because I think they're really silly. Um, you know, they're there's things that people tend not to use in their homes anymore. They're kind of obsolete and ostentatious um, at the same time. And uh, and uh, I was talking about them to a friend in Toronto, and she said, you know, the thing about chandeliers is that their whole function is to draw attention to themselves. And I really like that idea. So I just I had this thing in my head about chandeliers. So um, when I was working in my studio one day, um, I had all, all these stencils cut out of vinyl um, that had been cut for me at a, at a sign shop that I was using for stenciling my ceramic pieces. And I noticed that over time they would shrink a little bit and you would see this thin white line through the vinyl. Um, and I thought, you know, it's really a really beautiful contrast, this really thin, thin white shirt. So I just thought, well, what if I need a light box and just let the light shine through the, through the razor cut? And so I thought, I've got this like, chandelier thing spinning in my head, I'm just going to make a chandelier. Um, and so this was the first one that I started with, and uh, they're they're really kind of odd because when they're off, you can't see anything; they're just black. Um, and so um, the way that these are constructed is I, I work with, I work with an image and I send it off to a sign shop, and they print it out and give it back. So when I went to plug it in, it's like, oh, this is beautiful. I just love it. And uh, the uh, the guy that helped me. sitting in my studio and I'm just like, okay, I've got this thing now with So I lived with it for a while and just thought, you know, it's kind of lonely. And um, so I started thinking about it in context with my other work and my sort of, the practice that I've been doing for the last few years. And um, and this idea of sort of the, the obsolete, ostentatious kind of thing, which I think, you know, fits in with, with my larger body of work. And I thought, you know, what, what kind of image would fit with and so the Trans Am was, uh, was a really nice sort of connection for me. You know, these cars out of the seventies that are kind of silly now. Um, you know, but but as a as like a really young man, I was like, that's the car I wanted. I wanted like Smokey and the Bandit car. Um, and then and then from there, it just sort of progressed on to the Peacock, which is like also a really kind of silly animal, but loud and annoying and like obnoxious. And, but they've got this like plumage that's, you know, really ostentatious and um, useless. <laughs> I, I, I guess it's <laughs> So the trans <laughs> Sure. 
they're faster, they're not, uh, they're not silicon or something, so you have to inspect this all the way to get here. But I mean, that's, that's where the sort of 9 to 5 comes in, I punch my clock and, you know, I've just got all this stuff laid out and, you know, a, a lot of it is, you, you know, you shut your brain off and you just do the work. You know, when I decide to do something, uh, you know, I, I mostly figure it out from the start, like, this is what I want, and this is how I want it to work in the end, and now I've got three months of work to get there. And so, once I've sort of conceptualized it and figured out what the end product is going to be, then it's just time to put the time in. Yeah. And I think, that, like, that's a really, like, labor is a really, for me, labor is always a really important aspect of my work, because the community I grew up growing up in and live in, um, as people understand, like labor is a, is a regardless of what you're doing, like I often have farmers come to my studio because it's just a farm shop. And so, like, there's, there's no real privacy, like, people just walk in. So, often I get farmers coming in, they're, you know, they're interested in what I'm doing, but they're not quite sure about sort of the conceptual part of it. But they understand the labor. They, you know, often the comments I get from people who aren't involved in the arts are like, that must take a long time. And they respect that. And so, for me, labor is always. Seemed to be, it seemed to sort of like change the object a bit more. Um, and I like that idea. I like that idea that, that they're sort of reclined and you know, this one is titled Odalisk, which is a reference to you know, well, Turkish paintings or something of the reclined view. And so I, I like that sort of uh, anthropomorphous science. Um, so I think you just add, you know, add help.
firefighting is sort of quite similar. I mean, there are some women that are starting to get involved in it, but it's still this like uber macho kind of thing. And, um, and then I sort of have, you know, contrasted that with, um, you know, when my wife, when we were dating and she was in the university, this sort of like really strong second wave feminist kind of ideology. And I said, where does this all fit together? It's all kind of crazy. Um, and so, I mean, I think that, I, I think that, I mean, the military certainly, and, and my experience with the fire I mean, they sort of give me that position, that hyper masculine kind of position to work from. And I, and, um, and so I think, like, I always felt like with the, within second wave feminism, there was this, like, desire to, like, throw everything masculine and stuff. Like, you know, some, there's some beautiful things in there that you should, like, really look at me again. You know, I, I don't want to be, like, I don't think I want to be more in touch with my emotions or something. I don't think I need to cry or whatever. Like, I'm happy not to cry. So, <laughs> you know, uh, so, you know, I think for me, it's just like, like working it out, maybe showing other people, or, you know, let other people figure it out. That's like, that's your job. <laughs> <laughs> to make it more complicated. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Sure. But I mean, but not to like nag on it or whatever. Yeah. I think there's you can look at this show and really feel that you're embracing the masculine. Like this engine yeah. motor is sitting on the most beautiful, sure. delicate thing. If this was in my house, I'd have to be careful. I didn't just come out of the garden and sit on it. Right. Like it's, it takes consideration to how how would I engage with this piece of furniture, and it's like melting and relaxing on it, and, and it has its space. So you have this um, you know, masculine object really supported and comforted and nurtured by this, like, your, your home, you know? Right. This little engine has found its little space. And, and um, this piece as well, uh, you spoke of China being protected and delicate and something that's fragile and we need to look after it. So, it, you know, there's a lot of balance in the work, and yeah. it's just showing the viewer a new way to look at this at like a trans am or like you know you could you right. could play with the symbols and the juxtaposition speaks a lot of harmony in unique ways. Right. Well and I, and I think too I mean like I said I, I don't like to be naive. Like I'm not pretending to be naive about my work. Um, but it's it's it, but I also want to be a bit cautious about how I direct people in their way they look at it. I think that's all it really comes down to. Um, and I mean, like when I'm working in my studio, I, I don't sit there and think about like how how is this going to affect the viewer's perception of masculinity, or you know, I, I don't think I don't think about that stuff uh, when I'm making it. You know? um, and I, I think, like, really to be honest, what I think about is like how is this color going to work with this flower decal? You know, that's what that's what I think about. You know, that's I mean, I, I make aesthetic decisions. You know. But I know what these objects are, and I know what their histories are, and I, I know what the material speaks of, and um, I know what the implications of them are. Um, but uh, other people can figure that out too. Just I want to have one of this. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, no, no, I just something I just thought of too is that in your actual practice is in a way of blending with the masculine and feminine labor practice. Yeah, absolutely. taking taking apart these engines and going to the junkyard and figuring out the history of the motor right. and all that kind of stuff. But then going to your studio workshop and meticulously casting and right. the, working with the ceramics. Right. You're, it's you're just blending different it's just like that movie Ghost. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I was going. Right. <laughs> Sort of traditionally, ceramics have sort of lived in a, in a sort of. I mean, there's more women, I think, that have sort of engaged in that practice than men. And it, to me, it seems when men do engage in ceramics or do get sort of notoriety for it, it's because it's big. Mm -hmm. It's really big stuff. Right? Thank you, Clint.